My name is Will Meshnig, and I'm a discussion group coordinator and a member of the Student Advisory Board at the Dole Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program. Discussion groups are made possible by Newman's Own Foundation. This program is presented in partnership with the Millennial Action Project. We'd like to extend a special thanks to, Brian, to Blaine Volpe at the Millennial Action Project and Marion Currender at Freedom House for their collaboration collaboration. Today's program will be live streamed and available on our YouTube channel. You can also access videos of past Dole Institute programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. For virtual viewers, please send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. Again, that's dull questions, all lowercase, no spaces, at ku.edu. Please ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around, often impo on, around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind, and again, just ask one brief question. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now please join me in welcoming Kansas City Star reporter and former SAB member, Katie Bernard. Uh, today's guests are Representative Tori Marie Blue, who represents District 112 in Barton County. She is in her fourth term and is the Vice Chair of Higher Education Budget Committee. She also serves on financial institutions, pensions, and insurance committees. Representative Rhee Shu represents House District 25 in Northeast Johnson County. He is in his third term and serves as the ranking Democrat on financial institutions and pensions, as well as on the, on the Commerce and Agriculture Committees. He serves as the co-chair of the Kansas Future Caucus, along with Representative Arnberger, which is Representative Blue, <laughs> uh, which is comprised of all of the legislators, le legislators under 45 years old and seeks to solve problems along generational lines rather than fighting across party lines. Uh, welcome. Um, Hello. Yeah. Well, first to start off, you know, you're both the co-chairs of the, the Future Caucus. Can you speak a little bit to what prompted you both to join the caucus, take a leadership role, and what work you've done within it over your first few terms in office? Sure. So, um, first when the Millennial Action Project came to Kansas, I was in my first term, and um, we did not have a Future Caucus yet. And so uh, I joined then, I was just a member, and, and at the time it was just basically the, the, the co-chairs um, were the two folks who, who met them, at, I think it was at NCSL, um, who met them, and, and so they brought the Future Caucus to Kansas, so forth, at the time it was under 40. Um, we've had to raise the bar a little bit because millennials have gotten older throughout the age. Uh, we also have Gen Zers in our caucus <laughs> as well. Um, but at that point, uh, the, the Republican co-chair, she told me that she was aging out and she asked if I would become the Republican uh, co-chair and so I accepted and at that time that was when uh, Brandon Whipple, he is now the mayor of Wichita, he was a Democrat co-chair. Um, the next year he ran for mayor and resigned and so then uh, I don't know your uh, your end if free if if Map asked you, but ever since then we've we're a good team. Mm -hmm. We're together. All, we had lunch last week. We're we're a great team. Yeah, we hang out all the time. Um, I guess my answer has two parts. So there there's the the broad based view and a kind of a narrower set of why I decided to do this. So broadly, I think all of us are aware of of how divisive politics is at a national level, and then you know even now down to local school boards and city council races, and and I, I think that's very dangerous to, to democracy in a lot of ways. And so for me, and I think a lot of the Future Caucus, we're really aching for some sort of normalcy and, and, and just kind of um, partnership. And then so for me, my very first political memory was um, the Clinton trials w with Newt Gingrich, right? And it's basically just been downhill ever since then um, in terms of, of how we've talked to each other. And so I think we wanted to find a way um, to, to talk to each other in a more healthy way. Tori and I, we disagree strongly and passionately on, on a couple issues, maybe five or six or seven big ones. Um, but the goal is that, yes, yes, we represent our districts on those issues, um, but let's try to work together where we can and then where it makes sense. So, so that's what we really wanted to do. Kind of on a more narrow set, 
I also uh, got reached out to by Millennial Action Project at, at a conference. Um, and I was just really, really heartened by uh, the conversations I was having with all the other legislators from around the country. I actually had a really, really good conversation with a representative, a Republican representative from Maryland, who in a lot of ways is the, the mere opposite, or was the mere opposite of Kansas. They had a moderate Republican governor, um, but then supermajority Democrats. And so he was just like, yeah, I just gotta be really likable and make friends, and that's the only way that I can actually get any of my policies through. And I was like, I, I know that language. <laughs> um, and so he, he was talking about how he's really trying to push for right to repair, which is also something that, that I was interested in as well. And so just over a couple conversations with him, um, again, a, a Republican out of Maryland or a Democrat in Kansas, we were able to kind of strategize on, you know, which lobbyists would be there, you know, how to neutralize some talking points and stuff like that, which I thought was really cool. How has your membership in this group of younger lawmakers shaped your experience in the legislature? I think for me, uh, it will probably be one of the top three to five memories that I have of my time in my legislature. You know, I'll, I'll certainly remember the, the few wins that Democrats can get in Kansas, but um, for me, it'll be the people. And then I think we've created a really, really tight-knit group. We've always tried to, to say friends first, you know, get to know each other first, and then we'll kind of discuss the, the other stuff. We'll use our friendship as a way to discuss the harder issues. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I text all the time with uh, one, a very, very conservative representative in Brett Fairchild, um, who, who we agree on on nearly nothing, but then it kind of, there becomes a horseshoe theory to where we agree a lot on certain things as well. And so, um, you know, it, those types of relationships that you don't necessarily expect that you'll have going into it, um, that I'm gonna remember. I, I always think about, um so when I came in, I was the youngest legislator for four years. And so I worked really hard to make sure that, um, I, I hate to say that I worked really hard to say that I, that I wanted to be respected, but I did. I wanted people to make sure that they were taking me seriously. I was 23 years old, and, but I was there to learn. And, and, and through the legislative process and through the future caucus, I was able to make friendships with those who were in their mid 30s and so forth. And, and then the next election cycle when Re came in, a lot more younger people came in. And it was like, these are my people. Thank you for filing to run for office. Um, and ever since then, I mean, we started off with, uh, I think we, I mean, we started off and we said that we had 40 was our cutoff. But I think we said 40-ish because we had some that are like 42 and we wanted them to come to all of our socials. Um, but in the end, um, we're up to now, I think we have 32 or 34 in our caucus. Um, when I joined the legislature, I, I think the average age out of all 165 legislators, I think it was like 65. And now it's, I believe it, it should be much drastically lower. So, I, but I think, I agree with Rian. Um, I mean, like I said, last week we all went to lunch because it was during conference time and um, I think that a lot of the freshmen have had a chance to meet a lot of the Democrats on the other aisle, and a lot of Democrats have met a lot of freshmen and met a lot of Republicans on the other aisle. And so um, it's just, it's been a blast. And I love every moment, every social that we do. Have these friendships yielded policies that cross party line? Yeah, um, you know, again, not, not on the, the big stuff that might get a lot of the headlines, but I think the Future Caucus, we've worked really hard on housing Mm -hmm. over the last couple years. Um, one of the ver first things that we did uh, last term was create a first time home buyer savings account. It's kind of like a 529 account for, for um, houses. And you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but the Future Caucus spans a very wide range of political ideology, basically as conservative as you get in the house and as uh, progressive as you get in the house. And so even on that particular piece of policy, Tori and I as the chairs, we really wanted everybody to be able to be okay with it, even if they don't love every aspect of it. Like, like, let's show something. And so, you know, the conservatives didn't love tax credits, maybe, and, and the progressives maybe didn't love that, you know, these types of accounts, pretty much only like higher income people will probably use them. Um, but it did solve a problem. Housing is a problem for our generation. And, and so let, let's try to tackle it together. And it's been um, successful thus far, and we're still kind of tweaking some language in it in committee this year that Tori and I served together on. Um, but housing has been an issue that, that I think we've made a lot of strides on um, in my couple years. And I think something too that makes it different for us is we want folks after they graduate high school, after they graduate college, we want them to stay in Kansas. And so that's something that we've been discussing too is if the housing isn't there, 
why would you want to stay? And I tell you, I'm, I'm a very rural uh, legislator, and housing's not there. Another thing we've been discussing is child care. And um, so that's one. I can tell you the child care bill that was passed, it's not ideal. Um, but at least we started the discussion. I hope that the, the, uh, if there's going to be an interim over child care. I can tell you just in my town, we have over 900 slots of child care slots that, are, that we're, uh, we're short on. Um, and so I can only imagine what it's like in the, in the more urban areas. So another bill that we supported this year was allowing your campaign funds to be utilized for child care when you are at an actual event. Um, I don't think, did they actually get a vote on it on the Senate side? They pulled it, yeah. um, but that's what happens when you have good policy, then they get scared. Yeah, the, it can always be amendable to, to <laughs> other things is yeah. the unfortunate part. But um, that policy is very important to me. I have a three-year-old, and, and I remember my first couple of terms, I was just like, I don't know what I'm going to do with Astra, you know, for this fundraising event or, um, you know, for this event where I could meet, you know, other politicians, right? And then so I just didn't. Um, and so being able to use campaign funds to find a babysitter and use a babysitter um, has been really, really tremendously helpful uh, in my career, actually, to, to be able to do that. And then let alone, you know, I, I think we all know that young women have it especially hard um, in the legislature and in the workplace overall. One of the policies that the Future Caucus was very involved in pushing was, I think the number was 229, the, the Commission on Pay. Can you speak a little bit to the conversations that went into, you know, how do we go about addressing legislative pay and what it took to get something that lawmakers have been resistant to for years across the line to the governor? I think, um, and you may maybe, uh, Representative Sawyer talked about it within your guys' caucus, but I believe it hasn't been adjusted since the 80s, I think is what he, and he, was, he came in in 86. Um, I don't know about you guys, but a lot has changed since the 80s. And um, we make $88.66 a day. Um, so essentially, who you have running are your wealthier individuals. Um, I can tell you when I, like I said, I, I joined and I, I filed for office when I was 22. I was a senior in college, uh, got elected at 23. My, um, my expenses have been completely different from 23 years old to now. I'm married and we have a mortgage and uh, we're trying to start a family. Uh, and so there's just so many things that a lot has changed. And I think that if we want the right people and the best people to run, we gotta pay them something. So um, that's kind of been my, my, hand, my take on it and uh, I'll support it. I know some people say that they don't wanna vote to um, increase their pay and I get where they're coming from, but my thought is I'm looking for the future and I want the best of the best in the legislature. Yeah, and I think this was an interesting way, uh, an interesting bipartisan legislation too. It was a very mixed group on both sides, but the mix wasn't down to political ideology, the mix on who voted for it is how risky your district is. If you're a new legislator who just won a tough election, uh, I think both of our sides are like, just vote no, it's okay, we have the votes. Um, but everybody agreed that, that it was an issue to deal with. Um, you know, having just done my taxes, I think my take home pay from last year was like $12,000 that $13,000. One of the first conversations we have with, with our legislators at socials or just when I see other people are just like, hey, you know, how's your side job going? You know, how are you making income um, on the side? Tori drove Uber for a little bit to, to try to make it. I did. Make. I did. I was the only Uber driver yeah. in Great Bend. And um, uh, I thought I'd be really busy, but nobody knew we had Uber. So <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. And, and so it's just those conversations like that kind of shows that, that the pay is a, a true barrier of entry for, for a lot of people. Um, you know, kind of from both ends too. Like obviously if pay is too low, it, it kind of impedes the poor from getting in the legislature and that is certainly a, an issue that we have. But um, I have a fairly professional district as well. It's fairly high income and so when I'm approaching, you know, potential like doctors or lawyers or accountants for money, like I'm not giving up, you know, that much, that amount of money. And, and so it kind of um, precludes a lot of talented people who are, you know, on the professional end as well. So kind of all around, I think it'll lead to, to a more, um, talented and, and more robust legislature if we have better people running. Well, and, and Katie wrote a story about this, and, and so she came and asked a lot of, uh, I don't know if it was a lot of young legislators or uh, who you asked, but when she asked me, I told her, I'm going to be quite honest with you, if I were to be asked right now, and I was not in, 
be asked, Tori, will you run in 2024? I probably would have said no. I probably would have said, I can't afford it. Um, I will tell you that we've had to adjust at our house to make it work. Uh, I always joked with my husband, we met while I was in the legislature, and I joked, I'm like, are you only dating me, or did you only marry me? Because I have a really cool job. <laughs> and he's like, no, I think your job sucks. <laughs> um, but I said, and he's like, I married you for the big bucks. You make good <laughs> money in the legislature, so. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, in an increasingly polarized world, what is your approach to quote unquote bipartisan lawmaking? I mean, for me, it's, it's friends first. I, and part of this is um, political dynamics and party dynamics, right? I, I, you can't avoid that in, in this job that we do. I'm in the super minority. There's 40 Democrats and 85 Republicans. And so if I ever want to do anything of substance that's important to me, I have to have a lot of friends. Um, and so, you know, cynically, and then cynically is not the only reason I do this, but cynically, the Future Caucus helps with that. I've been able to make actual friends um, with a lot of people. And even if, you know, we disagree on something, it's really important to be able to just to like pull up your phone and text somebody like, hey, what do you think about this? Or just go to their office real quick and just be like, hey, what do you think about this? And just kind of gauge their views, um, even if they don't necessarily agree in the end. That, that, that's very powerful for me. And then, you know, non-cynically, um, it, it's just, I think, meaningful to, to be able to explain why something is important to you. Um, we were talking in the back, so I've had to play a lot of defense this year on pretty xenophobic kind of foreign adversary language that's been introduced in a lot of our bills um, by, by a statewide elected office holder. And, um, you know, because I think I'm fairly well respected, I've been able to talk to chairs and co-chairs and be like, hey, this language is bad, you know, it, it is much broader than it, how it's being sold to you. This affects basically all immigrants in the state. And they're like, all right, Reed, like we believe you, you know, we'll, we'll try to do our best on this. And so um, that sort of stuff in the end really matters coming from the Democrat side. I, I have to say, um, when I came in, the first thing I did was I have 164 other coworkers and I wanna get, I wanna get to know them. And so we have receptions almost every night, and so I'd always be the one to go sit at all the tables um, and get to know people. And um, I can tell you, this one, this really grinds my gears. Uh, we had a, a senator last year at one of the functions. She was going around telling everybody, oh, I'm Senator, senator so-and-so. I want you to realize that I'm here uh, to make sure that everybody knew that she was there. And she went up to me and I was talking to this uh, other gentleman that came all the way from Great Bend. And she goes, oh, that's so great. You brought your granddaughter with you. And I said, hi, I'm actually your colleague. Uh, nice to meet you. And so that was my biggest thing was, I wanna get to know everybody, who they are. Um, and so one person I really met my freshman year and, and became very close to, and I mentioned his name earlier, was Tom Sawyer. He's, he was in the legislature. He's a Democrat and he was in the legislature. Uh, starting in 1986. And so when we were talking about tax policy when I came in 17, he would say, well, Tori, this is why we did this in the 90s. This is why this was done in the 2000s. And I respect everything. Whenever he goes to speak at the well, I respect everything he has to say. And so I think that Future Caucus, that's something that I've really wanted to make sure that freshman Future Caucus members, they know we're all here to work together. Yeah, we're 45, but make sure that we're working with members who are over the age in the silver-haired caucus, if you want to call it that. But or no-hair caucus. Or no-hair caucus. <laughs> in the terms that you've been in office, do you feel like it has gotten easier or harder to engage in that sort of bipartisan work as the toxicity of partisan politics has only increased over the years? I think for, I mean, for me, it's gotten easier just as we get more experienced. You know, first term, Marie was a little hesitant to talk to people overall, but as I get into my second and th third terms, mm -hmm. um, and the Future Caucus keeps kind of building and, and becoming a thing, I found it easier to, to talk to people on the other side, certainly. Um, you know, are there kind of larger forces at play or kind of structural things with the legislature I have my frustrations with? Certainly. Um, but it, just in terms of like the actual conversations, I think it's been healthy. And I will say, um, when I knock doors and I talk to my Republican constituents as well, this is something that they are really heartened to hear that, that we're trying to do. Um, I say, hey, I have this future caucus thing. You know, one of my best friends in the legislature is Tory. You know, we try to really work together. We don't agree on everything, but we try to work together. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, I, I'm glad that you're at least trying to, to hear out the other side too. And then so I think, again, 
Well, it, it's not going to be immediate, right? Like, like turning down the temperature is not going to be immediate. But over time, you know, and as new people come in and they're younger too, and then maybe we're able to take them under our wing, you know, there, there's a better way to, to do politics. Um, and it doesn't have to be the, the firebrand stuff that, that we see all the time. And um, hopefully over time that, that takes hold. I have to agree with everything. He literally took everything I wanted to say. So it's been, it's definitely gotten easier for sure. Um, I think the other thing too though is your freshman year, you're brand new. And then the next term you have maybe 30 new colleagues. The next term maybe if it's a big year you have 40 or 50. Um, so you're getting to know these people but um, one thing I can tell you is I feel like I'm on the Democrat side on the floor quite a few, quite a bit more than uh, other folks, but usually it's, hey, uh, you want to go to lunch? Uh, <laughs> what are you doing after this? <laughs> um, so and to me, that's, that's like, again, like we've always said, friends first. Um, I used to be the recruitment chair for, in my sorority, and the one thing I always told my sorority sisters was, People join people and the organization follows. And what, that, what I mean by that is you want to get to know each other first and then we can talk about issues later or we can talk about the sorority later so forth, but get to know the person first. And that's one thing that we've really done. Do you see, you know, do you believe there are any risks associated with working across the aisle, whether it's from voters or from, you know, leadership within the legislature? Uh, I can tell you that I have some Republican colleagues who They've told me, Tori, quit talking to Democrats. But you know what, I wanna, I, when I leave the legislature, I wanna be known as somebody who is bipartisan, and that to me is way more important than somebody that just did what my party said. Yeah, I think one of my takeaways from the legislature is, is you will be surprised at how often you get along with people of the other party, even, like very different people in the other party, and you'll be surprised at how often you don't get along with people in your own party sometimes. And so, again, just all these different ways that you're able to make relationships and then find the people that you really do connect with is really important. Um, you know, my freshman year, I, I, I was put on agriculture committee, which is not a natural committee for a Johnson County uh, Democrat, right? But I, I loved it. And because I got sat next to two very, very conservative Republicans, I would literally never talk to them otherwise if not for this committee. They sit on the other side of the aisle, they sit in the back, I sit in the front. And so we just never would have interacted otherwise. But because we sat next to each other, we just started chatting about you know family and stuff. And he talks about how you know his wife's a nurse, my wife's a nurse, he, he loves taking his kids hiking, I love hiking. And so just all these other various factors of life that are not just our parties um, where we get along uh, really, really tremendously. And so again, you know, without being friends first and without taking that approach, you don't find that sort of stuff. Humans are, are deeply layered onions, right? And, and for whatever reason, and obviously in this job it makes sense, but I think even in the normal life, political party or political ideology has bubbled up to the surface, right? I, I don't think this used to be the way in the 80s or the 70s maybe, but now it is. Um, and so we just have to do, I think, all a little bit more work to dig and dig and dig and get into those deeper, um, m more impactful layers, I think. I kind of wonder, just based off what you just said there, I kind of wonder, though, with social media, now we are, we're closer. We know what's going on. Uh, I'm a big Facebook person. Um, and the reason I like Facebook, personally, is I like to know what are you doing and how was your vacation in Destin? And, oh, your kid's birthday party looked really great. Um, I do wonder just if that is what is breaking barriers to make it easier to work um, with, with certain folks compared to obviously um, in the 90s and 80s and 70s, that wasn't a thing. So I don't know, just food for thought. Piggybacking off of that, you know, you, you speak of social media as breaking barriers. Are there areas where it's building them up given that we're starting to see, you know, silos into true social Twitter, you know, Every political ideology has their own website now. Right, and I have to say, I mean, one thing, I don't, I don't like Twitter, personally. I read Twitter to see what's going on. I read your tweets to know what's going on in the Senate because you update us on everything. But that's really what I use Twitter for. The thing about Twitter is then you get Twitter fights and Twitter wars. And um, same with Facebook. They're on there, too. I don't like them. I've yet to see someone's mind change because of a Facebook fight. Um, so I just stay away from them. Uh, so there is that side of it too. I do know that some of our members, they fight on Twitter, um, but then they're texting each other behind the scenes um, about it. So I don't do it. 
but I may have been guilty of that before. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that's definitely a problem, and I, I think that's definitely a problem of the internet age that we have yet to solve. Certainly, um, I, I think people can opt in to whatever media they want to watch, and I think they can opt in to you know just whatever. Um, their opinions already are. And so it's very easy to get into an echo chamber, right? I, I think all of us can be guilty of it. Um, I think the media as a whole, no offense, but I think media as a whole um, is really, really um, engaged in, in or really incentivized by conflict, Democrat versus Republican. Um, you know, I, I use the sports analogy a lot. Americans are, are a sports obsessed country more than anything. Um, and we have somehow, over time, made politics into a, a sports match, right? There's two teams, you probably grew up rooting for that team, it's really hard for you to change your allegiances. Some people do, but it's really hard to do that. Um, but the thing about sports is that sports has always been an analogy for war, and, and, and politics is not that, and politics should not be that. Um, there's no reason why, why both teams, or other teams if they wanna join, even if they're smaller, um, there's no reason why, why all teams can't win in politics. Um, and then so again, that's something that I, I really, really strive for is that like, you know, again, there's, there's the issues that, that we disagree on. I get it. Um, we'll fight passionately for those, but on everything else, um, let, let's try to get to a place where we can all win. Do you think the public has an accurate perception of what level of agreement or bipartisanship exists or does not exist within the state house or more generally? I mean, I, with the one thing that we're told every year and granted, I don't know the actual percentage, but. 90% of all policy, 90, 95% of all policy is passed 125 to zero and 40 to zero, or, or there's a few that vote against it. Um, but I'm gonna be honest with you, those aren't sexy topics. Um, the first time home buyers um, bill that we had a, a technical cleanup on, it's not sexy to talk about what the one quick word that we changed. Um, but the other thing I, um, I really, learned and I've been, I, I'm big into, um, oh, on HBO Max there is, it's called Drain the Swamp, and it just talks about the history of politics in DC. And one thing it, t it talked about was um, arguing is what fundraises, and that's unfortunate, and that's where we've gone to, as being as polar opposite as possible, you raise money. And that's where DC's going, and I really hope that's not where we go in Kansas. Yeah, I agree with all that. Um, most votes are, are bipartisan, but it's it, it's hard to sell it. I mean, I, I think both parties uh, in various ways are revolved around uh, abortion nowadays, right? For all intents and purposes, like abortion is like the issue that divides the, the, the parties. And and so, you know, it, that that's obviously, especially in Kansas, gonna be written about for, for quite some time. And so that's um, newsworthy and our constituents care and, and you guys should be writing about that, but you know, again, there's a lot of cooperation that happens on, on kind of quote unquote down ballot issues that, that people aren't aware of that. And then, you know, I, I can't tell them that, like Tori said, that a lot of those things are important for them to, to spend their mental capacity on. Um, but that's kind of why we have a representative government. Um, you know, neither of us are beholden to anybody um, but our constituents on, on how we vote. And so just on those issues, trust us, we got it. Everything else, let, let, let's fight it out. Um, but you know, uh, again, it's the big five, big six issues. Well, and it kind of, what you just kind of piggyback off this, and I see Eric from the insurance office is here. Uh, the insurance commissioner and his, uh, they introduced uh, about 10 bills for insurance, and they're um, important bills, but if I were to go knock the door and tell them, tell my constituent, so we passed this really cool fund bill in insurance, they're gonna say, cool. Um, it kind of reminds me of the travel insurance bill that mm -hmm. we passed. Mm -hmm. It's important, but nobody really, I hate to say that nobody cares, but they don't. Do you talk at all about, you know, this bipartisan or non-controversial work when you're out on the campaign trail every two years? I do. Um, I live in a very Republican, deep red district. And um, there's times in my district that I, I'll just sit there and smile, and they're going, they're going so far right, and I just sit there and smile and, and uh, just say, yeah, well, I have to disagree with you, and well, I actually am uh, co-chair with the Future Caucus, and I'll go on, and then they'll walk away. Okay, that's fine. I don't, I, that's not the vote that I'm looking for. Um, so I do talk about it. I'm proud of what we do. 
And, um, but I also have the Democrats in my district that are just say, thank you, you represent us. And I, absolutely I do. So it's just different. And Ree's district, um, he, he, he flipped it when he came in. So it's just, it's a very, I would call it a purple district. No, Maybe not no, anymore. Nowadays, not so much. But, but, but I mean, yeah, you flipped yeah. it. It was, it was a very light red district yeah. before. Yeah, and I, I would agree. Nonpartisan, maybe not. You know, I'm not talking about the insurance bills at, <laughs> at the doors, but bipartisan certainly. And a, a lot of bills are are bi bipartisan. I mean, cutting the sales on tax on food that is an incredibly strong and impactful bipartisan thing. I, I think I say this a lot in the legislature, but like we only do like three or four things a year that like actually matter. Um, and, and cutting the sales tax on food is absolutely one of them. Absolutely bipartisan. And then um, you know we'll, we'll, we'll brag about those when we can. Are there certain issues that are more ripe for cross-party work than others? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, again, there's the big five, big six that we can't touch, but housing is the one that, that we've talked about a lot. Um, I think we can do some stuff on an environment, um, even if we disagree on maybe exactly what, but- Ban the ban. Uh, yeah, ban, ban <laughs> the ban. Um, um, yeah, I have to say, and I think, and what, what we did when we first started the Future Caucus when we came in together was we created a survey for all of our Future Caucus members to fill out, and it basically was what um, issues are important to you, what issues are not, like, not, not important, but what issues do you not want to touch, and in the end, it was, it was, we all agree on access to health care, but our avenues are different. Well, let's talk about the broad topic, access to health care, and how can we work on that? So those are some topics too that we've uh, discussed. And, and, and MAP, they have their own um, Millennial Action Project MAP. They have their own, um, oh, like subcommittees and, and environment is one of them. So I think, yeah, anything you can do to take your own reusable bags to the grocery store. They were just saying earlier how uh, they have, I've never been to an Aldi's, just throwing that out there, I'm Western Kansas. Um, but saying how, you know, they have their quarter. I don't know what the quarter's for. The Aldi quarter, yeah. I don't know what it's, <laughs> it's for. It's the only coin that, like, I own nowadays, my Aldi quarter. Um, I think another one, a good one is, yeah, locks the Oh, carts. okay, okay. So, so it makes you bring your cart back. Oh. Um, I think another issue? one, yeah, it's, it's like one less person they have to hire to go get the carts. Oh. Which is actually, good segue, workforce development okay. is another one. Um, and labor shortages is, is a big one that's kind of cross-party as well. Down the line, we're, we're towards the end of one legislative session. What are the issues you're looking at next that you see room for cooperation on? That's well, I, not to put you on the spot. Well, I know um, uh, a representative, he mentioned this at a mental health panel that we did over the summer, and we were asked what to expect during this next session. And he brought up a good point. He goes, every year, there's one topic that we never saw coming, and so it takes up a bulk of our time. At that time, he said Apex. That, we did not see that coming, and that took up a bulk of our time. So to, to answer your question, I have no idea. I think, I think realistically, I think we're going to see childcare. I think we're going to see workforce. I think, um, I already know on the Commerce side, the Chair of Commerce, he's looking at doing um, um, how can we support entrepreneurs and more entrepreneurs in Kansas and become a very entrepreneur, business-friendly state? Um, I think you're going to see more housing, um, just because housing is a big topic. Uh, so those are kind of some topics. I'm sure there's going to be another license plate bill. There always are. I vote against them. I hate them. Um, I'm sure we're going to name another state fossil. Um, but there's, there's some, uh, those are the bigger topics I think we're going to be discussing. And, and I agree with all those. And, and Tori individually was very responsible for kind of pushing the commerce here on the entrepreneurship thing too. It's something that she's very passionate about and, and, and um, I support as well. I think anything we can do to kind of help out, not just small businesses, but new businesses specifically kind of get up and going is um, really, really important. If we're able to get even one unicorn company out of all these various small businesses, I think that's tremendously impactful for the state. Um, and so anything that we can do to kind of, kind of foster that environment and get more venture capital money here in the state can only benefit all of us. How do you, you know, or do you encourage new lawmakers, but also older lawmakers who may not be, you know, part of the future caucus to engage cross-party? Um, I host a lot of dinners or socials or, or um, 
happy hours and just say, hey, and I just invite people as I go out. And a lot of times it's the same people that I talk to all the time, but I grab them on the way out. Um, I invited one the other day when we go from, um, oh, we had a break and I think it was a two hour break. And I brought a legislator from uh, Clay Center. He's a freshman this year. Um, he, he just, he doesn't get out a lot. And I said, all right, Bill, come on, you're coming with me. And so he's walking out and he goes, quit walking so fast. I don't have those young legs. And so I just took him out and got to meet some other people. That's another thing too is, is I got him to meet some of the uh, lobbyists that are in the building and, and they got to meet, they don't, I just imagine, and we have lobbyists here today that, um, they are the experts on the topics and they need to know all 165 of us as well. So um, that's kind of my, I guess, I, I guess if you want to call me, I feel like I'm the, the house social chair, <laughs> um, back to sorority terms, but. I mean, yeah, I, it's literally that. It's just like the soft skills that, that we all kind of inherently have. Tori and I just kind of, as being co-chairs of the Future Caucus, we kind of know more about more people. And so, um, you know, we bring in the new ones. We already have existing relationships with people we've served with through the last three or four terms. And so it's just kind of making connections where it makes sense. It's like, oh, you know, hey, this person has a really big interest in gardening as well. Like, you guys should talk about this. Or, oh, hey, you know, this might be an interesting conversation. You know, I heard that this person has a gay daughter. And so you guys might want to talk about that. And so, you know, it's just the soft skills of making connections um, that, that any workplace kind of benefits from. Well, and, and to kind of piggyback off that, and that is one thing um, I say through the Future Caucus, I feel like you are, like, we're allowed to ask each other questions that you're like, okay, I don't know if I'm politically correct. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, for instance, um, last week where I was talking to Re, I said, how many times do people mispronounce your name? And what are the different uh, mispronounce? And so then he explained to me how your surname in mm -hmm. China, mm -hmm. it goes, and I'm like, tell me about China. Mm -hmm. And so I just, we had those conversations and I'm like, am I politically correct if I'm saying this and so forth? And I, I think that's huge. I want to make sure that I'm not coming off offensive if I'm saying something because I, I'm going to be quite honest with you. Um, I don't live in a very diverse culture <laughs> district. And so I want to make sure that I'm doing everything that is correct and not offensive. Yeah, and I really appreciated Tori asking all those questions. I was able to, in like basically a five to ten minute conversation, give her a distillation of the Asian American experience, right? And then like, how how else are you able to do that other than her just being like, hey, like I I don't really get it, you know? Like like what does that mean? And I was able to explain to Tori that having a non anglicized name kind of taught me a lot of soft skills growing up, as well. Just like, you know, every time I have a substitute teacher, I had to be like. I had to do the math. Is this worth correcting them? Like, what's the best way to correct them? Um, and all that kind of stuff kind of matters and then kind of informs who you are. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, gay legislators. And then so, you know, again, as friends, we have kind of a non-judgment zone of just being able to like, hey, you know, what does this mean? Um, what does it mean to be transgender, stuff like that? And then, you know, maybe the vote do doesn't always go the way that you want, um, but at least there are avenues to kind of get a judgment-free answer to try to learn more. Last question, then we'll turn it over to audience Q&A. The most talked about issues in the legislature, the things that most people are gonna off the street know about are the contentious votes, things on school finance, things on transgender rights. How do you maintain cross-party relationships when you might vehemently morally object to votes that your colleagues have taken? It's, it's hard. I, honestly, this is one of the harder parts of the job. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of my colleagues are, are caring and good people, and then, um, but ultimately, I'm not the one that they are responsible to when it comes to their votes. The only people that they're responsible to their votes are their districts, and that, that's something that I have to just try to put into a box and, and, and understand. And so, again, um, compartmentalization is, is really important part of my job, especially being in the super minority. It's just like, you know, I don't get to run the calendar. I don't get to decide what we get to vote on. Um, but I do get to decide, um, you know, how to talk to people about it and then how to address the, the stuff that's really important to me um, afterwards. And so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a matter of just like, hey, these are the issues. I wish you didn't vote this way. Here's why it's important to me. But, you know, you're, I'm not the one who gets to reelect you or not. And yeah, and that's actually, um, I'll tell you, so Brandon Woodard, uh, he's a Democrat and he's uh, the ranking on higher education budget and I'm the vice chair. And um, there was a, a very, um, it was about, 
it, is it DEI, DIE, DEI? Yeah. DEI. Um, there, there was a, a amendment that came on to the budget that day and I was chairing for the chair um, and the chair brought it and um, he was very much against it and it got on, it was, it was Republicans versus Democrats and um, afterwards I said, you wanna, you wanna go someplace and let's just have it, let's just talk, you know? And he had a really bad day, I felt very uncomfortable, but we were able to go and just blow off steam before our next committee meeting. And, and that is something that I, in the end, I said, this is how politics should be. We had a bad day, let's, let's talk it out and then let's move on and let's, not, let's make sure that doesn't boil into the next committee meeting. Any audience questions? There. If you could change one, oh, thank you. If you could change one procedural rule for the House or the Senate, <laughs> which one would you change? Not work past midnight, even though that is a rule. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we work till 4:30 uh, fr into Friday morning, and I ended up voting. I voted with the Democrats to adjourn. I said, this is not smart to keep working this late. And we had a tax bill that had 18, 19 bills in it. And if anybody knows what's in there, they're lying to you. They're, we passed a major bill, and so I'm glad that we finally adjourned. But that is one thing um, that I think that it needs to stop, and we should get our work done sooner. Yeah, it's somewhat really. My answer would just kind of be kind of relooking at conference committees overall. I think by far conference committees are the least lower D democratic thing that, that happens in the legislature. Um, if you don't know what that is, that essentially just means what it's supposed to be is that the House has a version of a bill, the Senate version has a bill, let's say this one's a 3% tax cut, this one's a 5% tax cut. The conference committee is supposed to take that bill and just be like, ah, maybe 4% makes sense. Or maybe not, maybe the House stands firm and the House is like, no, it has to be 3% or, and then the Senate can agree or not, right? It's supposed to be kind of the, this narrow thing um, to hash out differences between the House and the Senate. What it's become, what it's become is essentially uh, anything goes, you can gut and go, anything on a whim in conference committee, you can bundle bills together in conference committee. Um, it, you know, there are kind of very, various guidelines you can use. Many of the times it happens at 2 a.m. in the morning, only six people are in the room. Um, there's five of them going at the same time, so the media can't cover them all at the same time. Um, it, it's just, it, it's impossible for us as legislators in the building to follow what's going on with conference committees. It is impossible, actually impossible for actual constituents to understand what's going on in conference committees. So that, that would be my choice. Good question. Well, it kind of reminds me of, I got asked by our economic development director about a bill and I said, well, the bill number mm -hmm. is dead, but that doesn't mean the topic is dead. And I said, I don't think it was anything conferenceable, but let me go back through all my emails of all the conference committee reports to see, and it just, it was exhausting. I mean, it's so hard. And in that week time span, if you think about it, I don't know how many bills, I think in the end, hypothetically, we passed 20 conference committee bills, but in the end, we actually passed 100 bills that were all shoved into a conference committee report. Yeah, it is crazy, whoever said that, <laughs> it's crazy. I think we got a question right there. What advice, Mike? Oh. What advice would you have for uh, someone seeking office that is in your position of being uh, young as you are, um, either an, in the campaign process or having been elected? Well, is 1861 hiring for, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's a lobbyist. Um, so I have to say, first I tell everybody, get involved. Get involved however you want to, however you can. Um, I was an intern in the governor's internship program, I can tell you, um, I wanted to just get to know the legislative process as much as possible and what happens in government in general. And I interned for DCF and I can tell you, I do not like child support. And they told me that from the very beginning, either you're gonna love it or you're gonna hate it. And I hated it. But I had a chance to learn the legislative process and how government truly works and how agencies work. Um, then that next year I interned for a legislator. Um, and then that, that, that same session, I ended up filing to run for office. So I say get involved as much as you can. 
We are always looking for interns, um, and we would love, or even even on the campaign trail, there's, I know um, a lot of the Johnson County folks, and, and Christina Haswood here in Lawrence, she has so many interns that always work for her, especially during the campaign trail. Just get involved as much as possible. Yeah, and then kind of more broadly, just, just do it. Um, the legislature overall is is under indexed even still in young people and then I, I genu genuinely this is not supposed to be ages like well, like wisdom and, and experience is, is immensely valuable and I'm so glad that we have the legislators that we do but structurally um, it, it makes it very difficult for young people to, to um, be there and so just, just do it um, you know I, I promise you that your voice is valuable. I promise you that you have something to add. Um, I, I promise you that, that you will have an impact. Um, you know, I, I, I see that every single day now that, that I have a little bit of ability to retrospect and just being like, I'm really glad I was able to speak up and do that. I, I would have, I, by orders of magnitude, probably 10 to one, I regret when I didn't do something more than I regret doing something. And I'm glad I ran for office and I'm glad I, I speak up when I speak up. And uh, I hope more young people do. Got one right there. Uh, this basically piggybacks. So I would say that I'm under the impression that a lot of people may be interested in running but are highly discouraged because of the perception of the, especially if you were a Democrat at the state level, be, being beat up. And in, in, so what kinds of words of encouragement would you give to people that were interested but like not sure they really wanted to take the risk? I mean, for me, it's the same thing that I just said. I, I think when I'm, I'm later on in my life and I'm looking at that, how I've chosen to, to live my life, I would have regretted not fighting and then running for office, um, and I'm glad that I did. You know, I, I try to live my life by having the fewest number of regrets later on, and so you're never going to regret, I don't think, fighting for what you believe in. You will regret staying silent, and then so... For me, um, if you feel like you have that fight in you, if you feel like you're okay being uh, in the super minority all the time, and you're gonna lose, and you're gonna lose a lot, and you have to wake up the next day and figure out how to fight the next day, um, we, we want you there. I promise you that we want you there. I have to just say, um, when I ran, everybody was just excited to have somebody who, was, who had the drive, motivation. Um, I was just, I, I was ex just excited. I think that's the only word I can think of. I was excited to learn the process, and my district was just, um, they were so supportive to have somebody who said, I'm here to listen. Can you educate me on this? Um, I don't know this topic. I, I'm here to educate, and, and they were just so happy to have somebody just listen to them, and I think that has been key in everything, um, especially when it comes to constituent services for me. Um, they, they have never, I, I will call them and say, hey, I got your email, could we talk about this? That way it's not over email. And they always say, I've never had somebody call me before on this. And that's, I think that's gonna be key for anybody who is running, wanting to run for office, young or old. Yeah, I think that's something people don't really realize about this job, is that it's actually like five or six jobs in one, right? There's like policy making, which we've talked a lot about here. Um, there's the constituent services part of it, which for me is like the literal baseline of this job. And a lot of people don't do it on, on both sides of the aisle. Is it like the, they won't return emails or they're slow to return emails. You know, we're, we're party leaders in our own ways. We're young leaders in our own ways. And every day we kind of have to balance all these different things. Um, but literally the baseline is like if your representative doesn't return your calls, then, then they should not be there. That, that is literally the baseline of this job, and, and uh, people deserve to feel represented and listened to, um, even if they don't agree on, on ideology, which, which comes up less than you would think, um, but people deserve um, to be heard. Okay. Uh, what do you find if someone is taking a policy, like from Democrat, what public, what advice do you would give, give us? Somebody young running for office, rather they're, or just in general, not, not running for office, just somebody young who is interested in politics? Yeah, someone who's young and interested in politics, yeah. I think just, yeah, the same thing on just being involved as much as possible, um, interning for the Capitol, getting on, involved um, within 
young Democrats, young Republicans. Um, there's, and there's college Republicans and college Democrats. There's so many ways to get involved. Go to your um, party's annual convention. Uh, there's so many ways to get involved and they're always looking for volunteers. So that, that would be my advice is just there's so many, I think the hard part is a lot of people just don't know where to start. And so I think starting with college Republicans, college Democrats, young Republicans, young Democrats, and then work your way that way. Yeah, and I think broadly, just like what you did just now, is don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, again, I, I always regret not asking the question um, more than I regret asking the question. And so you don't learn unless you put yourself out there and ask the question. And so, um, you know, show up at one of these events, ask questions, that'll probably lead to you asking a question to somebody else. And you just keep going until you get the, the answer that you need and the knowledge that you need. Online question. Um, it says, thank you for making time to, for discussion groups today. It was exciting to see young people like yourselves get involved. What drove each of you into politics at such a young age? Um, mine, well, okay, so kind of the, what drove me to get involved was the 2012 election. Um, it was the first time I got to vote for uh, a presidential election. And, you know, I took all the tests to know Yep, you're a Republican, yep, you're a Republican. But I wanted to make sure that I was voting for the, the candidate that I believed in, not just because of their party affiliation. And so then that's how I really got involved. Um, it was funny in my sorority. Um, I, you know, I had commit to Mitt in my, in my corner of the house. And then one of my sorority sisters had Barack Obama stuff. And so um, we always enjoyed watching uh, the news together and the election night. She. Got a victory, I didn't. Um, but it, that was kind of how I got involved um, because you know when he when they were talking about taxes and small businesses, my parents own um, my parents own a small business, and I'd call my mom and say, hey, "So help me understand when we're talking about tax cuts, like how much are we really talking about?" So that's how I got involved, and then I ran for office because um, my legislator, not that I disagreed with him, but he never responded back to an email. Um, he was gone from the legislature and I interned for three weeks. Nobody knew. He, that was three weeks that our district missed a vote. Um, and so that's why I ran for office and it's been a whirlwind ever since. I think my story is probably similar to most Democrats who won for the first time in 2018. And that was just kind of a, a post-Trump reaction to, to the world, right? It's just um, one of the first things that he did when he won the presidency was in, in, try to implement the Muslim ban, right? And as an immigrant, I just kept thinking, like, how many, like, three-year-old boys aren't going to get the opportunities that I had in this country um, to, to grow up in and be an American? I'm proud American. And so um, kind of all throughout that, I was kind of looking at ways to, to get more involved in, in politics. Um, I didn't really uh, think that I wanted to get deeply involved, I, I don't think, until um, Doug Moore or Doug Jones won Alabama. Um, in that senatorial race, and that, and that was the first time I was like, huh, if we can do that in Alabama, maybe Dems can have a shot in, in Kansas. And then so I started reaching out to some people. Eventually, it came to me that um, my district was represented by a three-term incumbent Republican, and they literally just couldn't find a recruit. And so it was either going to go unopposed, and this was a very effective guilt trip, um, but it was either going to be unopposed or it's got to be you, man. I was like, all right, I'll do it. I've never run a campaign before, but... Um, you know, I, I use this analogy a lot. Running for office a lot is like people coming to you and be like, hey, Tori, do you want to go to the moon? And you're like, yeah, the moon sounds great. That's fine. Let's go. But then nobody tells you how to build a spaceship. And then so you're just looking around. You're like, eh, I don't really know what I'm doing. And so you just kind of look it around and other campaigns. Um, the first phone call I ever made was for myself. Uh, the first door I ever knocked was for myself. Um, and then it was just kind of a a thing where you have to grind every single day and just have the discipline to, to knock a bunch of doors, especially if you're running against an incumbent. And so, um, you know, eventually I won by 120, 20, 122 votes, uh, which is, I believe, just about 1% or less than 1% of my district. So when people say, I don't vote because my vote doesn't matter, it's not true. I mean, we've had a couple votes that, um, that they've won by 60 mm -hmm. or... Um, Barb Wassinger, when she won in, in Hayes for the first time, I think it was 34. Um, so, I mean, it's, they're close. Every vote matters. Got one right there. All right, 
just just for my edification, uh, five or six big issues. I, I may be coming a little bit late, but could you summarize what those five or six issues are, so that lay people who read the media can can say, "Yep, I heard that." Uh, just a guess. I don't know if I can get to five or six, but abortion certainly, guns, gay rights. I would say how your taxes are taxes are done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Schools, maybe. Schools, yeah. Help Medicaid expansion. Yeah, and I would say essentially it's like right now it's how is the surplus dollars? How are they being utilized? And um, so you know, like mental health. Uh, I don't think that's a uh, I, that that is something that we all agree on. But how you spend the money is is where we disagree on it. All right. There's last call for questions. All right. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.